So good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Harry Sokol. I am professor of gastroenterology in Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. I want first to welcome everyone to this international webinar course on microbiota and gut brain connection, a new frontier in neurogastroenterology, which is sponsored by Bromatech and supported by ESNM. Tonight, we have two excellent speakers. Joël Doré, first, uh, who is research director at the French Research Institute in Agricultural Science, INRA. He will give a talk on the human microbiota, state of the art, and future perspectives. And the second speaker is Yolanda Sanz, professor and head of the Microbiome Innovation Unit at the Institute of Agrochemistry and Food Technology of the Spanish National Research Council in Valencia. And she will give a talk on dietary recommendations for promoting gut microbiota health. Now, I want to remind everyone that questions can be asked via the chat function, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Regarding the translation, I will now uh, explain you how to proceed. So uh, to follow this webinar in English, please do not change your Zoom audio settings. To follow the Italian or Spanish simultaneous translation, click on the interpretation icon and then choose your language. You can then choose mute original audio to mute the background English audio. On mobile phones and tablets, you may need to tap more to access the interpretation icon. It is advisable to install the Zoom app instead of using the browser. Now I want to give the microphone to Professor Giovanni Barbara from the University of Bologna, who is the chair of the Gut Microbiota and Health section of ESNM. Thank you, Harry. It's a great pleasure to be here. <clears throat> On behalf of uh, the Gut Microbiota for Health section of ESNM, I would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. <clears throat> this webinar is uh, one uh, uh, in a series in the field of gut microbiota. And uh, we had the pleasure over this period uh, to have the brightest uh, stars in the galaxy of gut microbiota talking in these uh, webinars. Uh, just to name uh, a few of them, Ted Deenan uh, talking about uh, gut brain connection, uh, Kazim Aziz, Kevin Whelan, uh, Steve Collins, uh, Alessio Fasano. And tonight uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, two great stars in the field of uh, gut microbiota. Uh, Yolanda Sanz and uh, Joël Doré. And uh, these webinars uh, were uh, uh, organized by ESNN and uh, Gut Microbiota for Health with the unconditional support of uh, Bromatech. And it has been uh, a great pleasure. And uh, these uh, seminars were uh, definitely very well attended uh, over time. And I think that uh, tonight there will be also a success. Uh, I see the numbers of people connecting and uh, definitely we have uh, a very good audience. And uh, what I would like to tell you before we start is that uh, at Gut Microbiota for Health, uh, we have uh, some uh, um, uh, good uh, uh, activities that we want to stimulate and encourage uh, research in the field of gut microbiota. Uh, we want to provide a forum for dissemination uh, of uh, discoveries in the field uh, and also to promote science and education activities in this field. So there will be in the future uh, more to come and uh, I would like to ask you to stay tuned. You can go to our website, uh, just going uh, to the uh, ESNM website, uh, www.esnm.eu and then you can click uh, to the gut microbiota for health section and then you will uh, get uh, into the into the website which is very active uh, and uh, i encourage you to to visit it so uh, just uh, to start promptly and i don't want to take uh, time uh, to our speakers tonight uh, i would like to um, uh, ask you to listen uh, carefully to the two talks which will be Definitely very inspiring and enjoy tonight's show. Thank you very much. So thank you, Giovanni. So we now give the floor to Joël Doré. Please, Joël. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you, Giovanni, for the uh, introduction. 
Uh, let me put up my slides. I would like to express my gratitude before I begin uh, to uh, Bromatech and ESNM for this uh, opportunity I'm given today. <clears throat> um, let me see. Um, uh, excuse me, I have a few clips here. I need this off. <clears throat> um, okay, let me start here and switch like that. Okay, um, thank you. Sorry for the uh, few adjustments. Um, so I will give this presentation on the uh, human microbiota and as you will see, um, I will need to uh, talk more of human as a symbiosis, rather than just talking of the microbiota itself. Uh, I will start with a, a disclaimer, uh, emphasizing the fact that uh, in my units, we uh, work a lot with the uh, industry. I do give lectures and uh, I also did contribute to uh, editorial work with the book, The Intestinal Microbiota, a full-fledged organ, uh, co-coordinated with my colleague, Philippe Marteau. <clears throat> I'm also scientific advisor in boards of Mad Pharma, Biofortis and Isopia and co-founder of uh, Mad Pharma, um, uh, Novobium, and uh, GMT. Now, we humans are microbial. We are a symbiosis. We are ecosystems. Uh, we do interact on a constant basis with uh, as many as 50 trillion bacteria. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Joel. We cannot see your slide moving. We are still on the first slide. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let me um, let me probably quit if I if I can move to this sharing, and you will tell me <clears throat> whether you do see the full screen. Sure. So. Now you are, we have the presenter view, I guess. Yeah. You have the full screen, Ari? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, so we are host to this 50 trillion bacteria, many more microbes, in fact, um, including phages, um, archaea, um, yeasts, fungi, protists, <clears throat> and, oh, geez, yeah. Um, now we use metagenomics to count microbial genes, and we have uh, counted as many as 600,000 microbial genes on average per individual, which is 25 times the size of the human genome, just giving an idea of the complexity of functionalities the microbiome will contribute. <clears throat> um, I will organize my presentation in uh, uh, three parts. First, giving uh, highlights of what we have got to know from uh, metagenomic studies, uh, then um, going into details of what I mean when I mention symbiosis, uh, and then highlighting the um, expectations we can have in terms of innovations on the basis of uh, man-microbe symbiosis. <clears throat> we have been uh, studying the microbiota using molecular techniques for a while already, some 30 years probably, starting with the uh, uh, amplification of 16S ribosomal DNA genes and sequencing. Um, and this has been leading to a situation where we have uh, what I do call here laboratory dependent observations, meaning that there is no international standards for what is often called phylogenetics, phylogenomics, or barcoding. Uh, and at the turn of the century began a, a very special moment where we started to analyze the microbiome using whole metagenome shotgun sequencing, much like we do sequence the human genome, in fact. And this has led to the uh, inception of standards, internationally acknowledged standards uh, published in 2017 for what I will call here metagenomics, true metagenomics. <clears throat> Uh, we could point out the fact that uh, pre-analytical aspects, you know, from stool collection all the way to DNA extraction were really critical for the process. Uh, and recently we revisited um, 16S ribosomal DNA-based 
characterization in a study where we uh, essentially had a pilot study, five volunteers, two samples collected two months apart, and we did the extraction of DNA, which we supplied to five laboratories performing 16S ribosomal DNA sequencing that we compared to metagenomic uh, shotgun sequencing. And essentially, if every one of those laboratories using his own pipeline for bioinformatics, what you see is represented here where the distance between two dots that represent samples uh, represents the uh, uh, the diversity or the uh, difference between samples. So uh, what this is showing is essentially each and every laboratory will give a different picture, will possibly tell a different biological story. And what we did is we reanalyzed everything with the same bioinformatic pipeline. And then, and only then, do we see that we, uh, we recover similarities between the analysis, except for one sample set where the primers for amplification were different. So obviously we knew that, but the amplification is really key. Um, and still it's somewhat different from shotgun metagenomics shown in red here. <clears throat> now the process we use today is essentially uh, highlighted here. We extract total DNA from stool sample most of the time and apply whole genome shotgun sequencing for metagenomics, the characterization of the combined genomes of all microbes dominant microbes within a system. Uh, we assemble and annotate genes and we were led to build reference gene catalogs. Today, we essentially map short sequences onto the reference catalogs and that generates metagenome profiles. And in a few highlights, early lessons from that, and I will illustrate some, uh, led us to, um, to realize that we share a very small set of common bacteria species between individuals, which we consider a core metagenome, and yet we do harbor a large, unique set of microbes. It does evolve very slowly over time under normal conditions, which means that it is ecologically resistant and possibly resilient. It will recover after a moderate stress. Uh, we know that we differ by gut ecology. We described four different gut ecologies, which I will illustrate uh, further on. And we also differ by gene count, by the number of dominant genes per metagenome, uh, low gene count being recognized today as a health stratifier. And finally, we identify specificities in microbiome conditions or composition that we consider diagnostic in terms of signatures, sometimes predictive models in conditions such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, liver sources, and many more that I will mention. <clears throat> now, if we look at the count of genes, uh, we are talking millions. We essentially analyzed the microbiota uh, by 2014 of something like 1,267 uh, individuals from Europe within the MetaAid program, from China, from the USA with the HMP studies. And we were able to identify at the time 10 million genes. And essentially the curve was still rising, meaning that if we were to characterize more people, then we would identify more genes. What is also shown in the colors here is that the common genes are not rising, they were essentially captured very early on, especially for genes in red here that are common to 50% of the co community that we study. Uh, only 100 individuals were enough to capture those. Uh, they may be most clinically relevant to define health or altered health conditions in common diseases. We did similar analysis with animals. In, um, well, in humans, we see 10 million genes, roughly 1,500 metagenomic species. In pigs, from nearly 300 pigs, 7.7 .7 million genes and over 700 species. And in chicken, 300 chicken, 9.7 million genes and more than 2,000 species. Um, now, are we so different? Well, we did identify species that are highly shared between humans, almost always present in a uh, community of several hundred individuals. Uh, th they are listed here. And the important point here is that we're talking of 18 shared species out of, on average per individual, roughly 300 dominant species. So it's only a small fraction of our gut microbiota, but still it's highly important that they are conserved. And also noticeably that for many of them, we have cultural representatives. 
which is not the case for most of the species I was mentioning where I talk of uh, thousands. Um, and then we looked at the conserved uh, ecological arrangements, and we showed that we differ in terms of ecology with a few preferred organizations. Again, this is a number of individuals essentially illustrated here. So we have many individuals with a configuration dominated by the genus Ruminococcus, uh, individuals with a configuration dominated by the genus Bacteroides, and another with the genus Prevotella. In fact, we could split the Bacteroides uh, anterotype, as we call them, into two high richness and low richness anterotypes. Um, one element I have to mention here is that uh, based on work by Gary Vu in the US, we're able to show that there is an impact of dietary habits on the ecology of the gut microbiota, the Bacteroides anterotype being highly represented among individuals that have what we call a Western diet, a Western diet meaning low in fiber, high in, um, in fat, proteins, and uh, rapid sugars, versus a high proportion of Ruminococcus prevotella and types among individuals with a, a diet rich in uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, we also connected this observation with gene richness or count of dominant genes. And I will emphasize this in this one slide, where I show human microbiomes differ by gene richness. Here is represented the number of individuals as a function of the number of genes in the dominant gut microbiome. Uh, and what you see is that it's not a bell-shaped curve, a usual bell shape. It's a, a curve with a shoulder to the left, meaning that there are individuals with low richness microbiome and individuals with high richness microbiome. In brown, what you see is the enterotypes, the Bacteroides enterotype, as I was mentioning, is this division between low richness bacteroides and high richness bacteroides. We know today that it has a meaning in terms of health and disease. <clears throat> okay, another um, uh, aspect that we can investigate when we use metagenomic is the possibility to screen the dialogue between bacteria and human cells. And we use reporter cell lines, very classical, that are usually used to test the impact of uh, cultured pathogenic microbes, for example. Uh, they will emit light or color uh, when they are activated in some pathway. And that allows to identify genes and molecules of interest. Well, what we have done is we superimpose our ability to extract uh, total DNA, high quality DNA, and to clone very large fragments, 40 kilobase inserts, meaning 40 to 50 genes from a bacterium that may or may not be cultivated uh, in vitro. And then we generate those libraries that can be screened in high throughput onto human cells. Uh, we have started this uh, approach in 2007. We have today more than 500,000 clones uh, from uh, uh, metagenomes. They represent several equivalents of human genomes, actually. <clears throat> and what we analyze, what we explore, is the ability of microbiota to modulate several parameters, immunity, uh, cell proliferation, um, metabolism, and also from enteroendocrine cells that produce uh, um, endocrine peptides, hormonal peptides that are active in the brain, uh, essentially potentially regulating the perception of satiety. Now, uh, why were we led to mention or to document uh, human uh, symbiosis in health and disease? Uh, I will start emphasizing the fact that uh, Host microbe symbiosis starts, is a relationship that starts from birth. And essentially, we meet with the microbial world at the moment of birth, at the very moment of birth. And following birth, we will mature our immunity at the same time as we develop our microbiota. And this will lead to a key situation where it is a unique symbiosis, mutual benefits, where microbiota, the dominant healthy microbiota is recognized as a component of self by the immune system, by our natural defenses. So considering uh, humans as symbiosis will have strong impact in terms of prevention and therapy for evaluation, for monitoring, and for the design of treatments. Uh, we are talking actually of this uh, 
interaction between human genes and functions and microbial genes and functions. And the functions of the microbiota are actually expressed at interfaces, interface with food, with the supply of vitamins, some of which are directly supplied by the microbes, with the potentialization of dietary ingredients, such as dietary fibers, the production of short-chain fatty acids that are signal and energy sources for human cells, remodeling of polyphenols that can be very active anti-inflammatory or um, uh, uh, antioxidants, and recirculation of bile acids and detoxication among many functionalities, um, interface at the level of other environmental microbes. The microbiota does express antimicrobial protection. It prevents from proliferation from environmental bacteria and interface at the level of cell, human cells and human tissues. Uh, we see promotion of tissue development and renewal of cells, not only at the level of the gut, uh, immune stimulation and homeostasis and signaling and regulation beyond, uh, sometimes far beyond the gut at the level of uh, adipose tissue, uh, the liver, the lungs, the heart and the brain. <clears throat> Now, one of the key motivations to address those questions is, are illustrated on this slide, where what is shown is the result of epidemiological studies that illustrated the fact that through the second half of the previous century, we were able, thanks to uh, incredible progress in medicine, uh, to control uh, ever better infectious conditions. Uh, all the infectious conditions were on the downslope, and at the same time, what was observed is a rise in incidence, uncontrolled for most of them, uh, of chronic conditions with uh, immune disorders associated. This is the case for Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease, for the autoimmune multiple sclerosis or type 1 diabetes, for the allergy uh, such as asthma. But this is also true for obesity, for diabetes, for hepatic uh, conditions, liver conditions, as well as uh, neurological conditions, neurodegenerative and neuropsychological conditions. So we are in a situation where a World Health Organization predicts that by 2025, one human in four will be concerned by one or the other of those chronic conditions. Prevention is really an urgent need. Otherwise, possibly human longevity will be at stake and prevention may be a key asset based on nutrition. Now, how did we get there? Uh, there are only possibilities we can propose, but we have uh, through two or three generations changed everything that concerns birth, meaning birth mode and environment. We have changed nutrition and life habits quite a lot. And we have changed exposure to uh, chemical compounds we call here xenobiotics. <coughs> uh, the special case of autism is illustrated here with the increase in incidence in the USA. Uh, it's such that one birth out of 50 today in the USA is concerned or will be concerned during its life uh, with autism. <clears throat> Part of this is obviously due to uh, increase or improvement in diagnosis, but it's only up to 25%. So the increase is exponential and uncontrolled. Now, what can we say about these conditions? Well, the problem uh, in the past was that of infectious condition, where we have one agent leading to one risk, possibly leading to one disease. And what we are confronted to today is uh, 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 a situation where at the core, is the relationship between the host and the microbiota, what I call symbiosis, which is under the influence of many, many, many factors, stress, diet, um, physiology, antibiotics and other treatments, age, of course, uh, and genetics. But it is the deregulation of host microbe symbiosis that will lead to risk and potential disease. So tools to deal to deal with innovation and translation in this totally different systemic configuration have yet to be invented. And this is true for uh, clinical trials. <clears throat> now, what we have still, what we have been able to show is that in many conditions listed here, 
that concern the central nervous system for autism, major depressive disorder, multiple sclerosis, the gastroenterological arena with IBD, IBS, or uh, liver conditions, metabolism with uh, insulin resistance, obesity, type 2 diabetes, or immunity per se with allergies or even cancer immunotherapy. In those many conditions, we were able to describe what we call dysbiosis, essentially centering our, our uh, focus on alteration of the microbiota. What we have come to realize since is that what we deal with is actually a disruption of host microbe symbiosis, um, combining alteration of the microbiota with leaky gut syndrome, with an inflammatory state, and oxidative stress in situations where essentially we have no current prevention, no cure. <clears throat> now, if we go a bit further, because the observation does not tell us much in terms of causality, we have some indications of causality. I can only say indications. It's not uh, formal and definite, but they are based on application of microbiota transfer. When microbiota alone can induce altered symbiosis and confer risk or respond, reproduce sorry, symptoms of pathologies, then we think that there is a link that is a causal link. And we see that upon transfer of the microbiota from humans to animals, essentially germ-free animals. This has been shown, for example, in autism, in major depressive disorders or multiple sclerosis, in Crohn's disease, Nash syndrome, cirrhosis, or obesity. And there are many pieces of work ongoing uh, to expand on that. Um, the second aspect we explore is when microbiota alone can restore normal symbiosis and attenuate symptoms of pathologies. This is from man to man, microbiota transfer from healthy individuals to patients where we try to see whether we can alleviate the symptoms. This has been shown in uh, autism spectrum disorders, in ulcerative colitis, cirrhosis and insulin resistance as examples. And again, there are many more explorations ongoing. So we are in the situation where we describe now dysbiosis as a disruption of host microbes symbiosis with these four triggers somehow, low richness microbiota, leaky gut syndrome, inflammation, oxidative stress. And we question the fact that possibly this could turn in circle basically each and every <clears throat> trigger can activate the next one. So we can have circular causalities. If we do have circular causalities, then there is no continuum between the states of health and pre-disease or disease, but rather disruption. And I will tell more about that. But in this case, we actually have four actionable triggers, whether we want to develop diagnostics or prediction or prevention and therapy. So we can rethink the way we address uh, pathological situations on that basis. Now, I was mentioning the fact that uh, we can have drastic uh, shifts in the uh, state of symbiosis if indeed we have the possibility of a vicious circle. Um, <clears throat> and this is to illustrate that, basically. Uh, there's, there's been writings in uh, uh, systems dynamics since the 1980s by René Term, a French mathematician, uh, picked up again by Martin Schaeffer in Holland uh, since 2009, and essentially illustrating the fact that if you stress the system that will start here in equilibrium, then it will slowly shift. But as long as you remain within its ability to, uh, to restore normality, it will be resilient. So if you remove stress condition, it will return. But if you push the system beyond its robustness, then it will possibly induce the vicious circle, bounce into another state of equilibrium. And in this case, the vicious circle will actually lead the system to remain for a long time, even if you remove the stress condition in the altered configuration. And it will take really drastic return to normality before you can hope to restore normality uh, in terms of a uh, gut microbiome and uh, uh, homeostasis. Now, we tested in an animal model, uh, and this was published last year, uh, whether inflammation alone could trigger a durable alteration of host microbe symbiosis. This was done in a rat model where we used dextran 
sodium sulfate as an inducer of inflammation with chronic inductions. And then we let the animals quiet for 40 days and we try and see whether after those 40 days, the system is altered. Essentially, we will start with basal state of the host, integrity of the gut wall. Uh, we will start with the basal state of the microbiota, highly diverse microbiota. And we question whether after 40 days, some animals could end up in a situation with where they combine altered host state and altered microbiota state. And indeed, this is what we observe. We observe a bimodality of the distribution of the animals uh, as a function of host state, bimodality as a function of microbiota state, and the animals that long after we stop induction remain in a situation where they combine altered host state and altered microbiota state are those that received the high dose of inflammation inducer. So we humans are microbial, we are ecosystems, uh, the human host tissue and organ inter interacts with the microbiome with mutual benefits characteristic of a symbiosis. Um, altered host microbe symbiosis will lead to loss of protective functions, circular causalities or alternate, may lead to um, alternative stable states. And that may apply to host microbe symbiosis or its alteration. And this will have implications for future of monitoring, of prevention, of via nutrition or therapeutic management of the human uh, microbial human. So I will lead to, um, or this will lead me to microbiome based innovations. And I will start with microbiome testing and symbiosis uh, monitoring. <clears throat> um, so low gene count is the uh, indicator or biomarker I will, I will emphasize here. As we have been able to show, and you remember uh, that humans may differ quite a lot in terms of gene count. I call here low gene count post-symbiosis. Um, and there can be individuals with high gene count. Uh, if we separate actually in this uh, 300 or so population, obese in orange, non-obese in green, what we see is that it's really bimodal. Uh, it's around 10% or so of a healthy non-obese population in the uh, low gene count side, around 25 to 30% for the uh, overweight and uh, low, uh, moderate obese individuals. It's up to 75% if we go to extreme obesity with BMI over 40, 42. And we were able to show that low gene count is associated with altered metabolic and inflammatory traits in obesity. This is not only um, higher weight, but it's altered metabolism uh, and altered inflammation. It's also associated with the non-response to calorie restriction in obesity. Uh, meaning here that we can predict that an individual that has a microbiome configuration, uh, putting him in post-symbiosis, will not lose weight, will not improve its BMI, but also will not improve its inflammation, its uh, diabetes uh, parameters upon dietary uh, uh, calorie restriction. It's associated with the severity and speed of progression in acute liver conditions. And finally, it's associated with non-response to cancer immunotherapies. <clears throat> now, uh, we still, we do have uh, indicators, biomarkers, possible signatures of low richness microbiota, of intestinal permeability, such as tight junction proteins, of inflammation such as very basic white blood cell counts or CRP or soluble CD14 um, and oxidative stress such as uh, MPO or MDA, well-known parameters that could be combined into a diagnostic model. This has not uh, been done so much for the moment, but what this could lead to is a next frontier where microbiome profiling and symbiosis monitoring could enter clinical practice. Upon prescription, um, actually medical biology laboratories could perform altogether the classical biological uh, bioclinical measurements and fecal microbiome analysis. Well, obviously the goal would be upon prescription of microbiome testing to uh, detect altered symbiosis, to monitor symbiosis status over time upon prescription of treatments, for example, and to integrate symbiosis status into nutritional and clinical management. Now, moving to signatures of biomarkers requires validation 
and verification trials. Uh, this means that it requires more science, evidence base, and big numbers. Just one slide of big numbers to uh, let you know that uh, as um, end of 2019, the million microbiome of humans project was initiated uh, in China during the 14th uh, International Conference on Genomics. And uh, as part of the uh, Million Microbiome of Humans project, my institute in IA, my unit Metagenopolis, is initiating in France the pre-competitive 100,000 French microbiome projects. The goal being to indeed characterize the gut microbiome of 100,000 French individuals together with the Microbiome Foundation and combining citizen science for healthy individuals as well as the uh, many cohorts uh, from the network. Uh, anyone interested actually to uh, uh, join the adventure is most welcome and uh, Karin Vallet is the colleague taking care of, uh, uh, of that. <clears throat> uh, to go a bit further, uh, we have uh, very good reasons to know that bugs can be uh, used as drugs in the future. Uh, and one of the indications we have for that is that uh, a number of commensal bacteria have been characterized that are able to express functionalities that are protective. Um, now, this is the case, for example, for Bacteroides fragilis. Uh, Sarkis Masmanian is the uh, uh, prime laboratory that uh, did show that. And they could identify that uh, polysaccharide A is the bioactive molecule. And they actually did create a company, which is called Axial, to uh, move towards uh, phase one, phase two, uh, first in man trials. And it's the same for Fecalibacterium prasniti that Aristocol we know very well, uh, and he's um, also involved in the Excelium company, uh, for Eubacterium halli, for Acermantia mucinifila, and many more. So we are in this context where commensal bacteria have been documented functionalities and are moving into uh, human trials to validate whether they can serve as uh, uh, treatments in uh, many disease conditions. Now, microbiome richness, the underlying ecosystem may still be a crucial factor for success in these developments. Um, in fact, implications go a bit beyond uh, knowing that uh, uh, if we uh, consider the vicious circle I was mentioning before, um, nutrition was essentially targeting the microbiota and well, the clinics, the therapeutics were essentially targeting inflammation as a symptom. Well, we have, um, as I was showing before, we have tools to um, modulate the microbiota, but we also have tools to modulate intestinal permeability, inflammation, and oxidative stress. So why not imagine a situation where we would be applying bioactives to essentially tackle all four triggers of a vicious circle. Now, this is what I'm illustrating here. The publication is under writing, but this is essentially the uh, holistic approach or four trigger approach to restoration of symbiosis in a pilot animal study in a mouse model of depression. The animals are essentially induced to altered behavior upon four weeks of chronic stress, and then they are treated. Uh, the usual treatment obviously is an antidepressant, but here we are comparing the usual treatment with glutamine, as an active on the microbiota and intestinal permeability, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG as an actor on intestinal permeability and inflammation, and curcumin, a polyphenol, as an actor on inflammation and oxidative stress. And what we are seeing in this context is uh, illustrated here. Well, we do see that the uh, stress induces alteration of anxiety-like behavior, induces alteration of depressive-like behavior, uh, but the um, uh, the administration of the bioactives, especially when we have the three bioactives, will do as well in correcting alterations of behavior as will clomipramine, which is a classical tricyclic parental antidepressant. So we have synergistic efficacy. We have the three bioactives that do as well as an antidepressant that has, incidentally, many secondary effects that we will not see with the uh, nutrition grade bioactives we were using here. <clears throat> to go a bit further, ecosystem microbiotherapy is what I want to illustrate, essentially going towards fecal microbiota transfer. The concept here, and I'm stealing this slide from Isocol, is to uh, try and replace 
a dysbiotic microbiota by the uh, administration of a eubiotic microbiota. Uh, and the goal, obviously, is to restore a functional symbiosis. Uh, the turning point was this publication in 2013 in condition of recurrent Clostridium difficile infection, showing that um, the um, standard of care, vancomycin, was doing uh, far um, worse than the new treatment, fecal microbiota transfer, which upon one single treatment was able to cure Clostridium difficile for more than 80%, and upon repeats, if necessary, more than 90%. The clinical trial was actually interrupted uh, at intermediary analysis. It was non-ethical to go further owing to the extreme difference in efficacy. All patients essentially went to fecal microbiota transfer, and it was eventually acknowledged by regulatory bodies, and it is applied today on a daily basis to cure thousands of patients every year. It's essentially saving lives. Now to illustrate uh, other examples, I'm giving here this example from work by Max Nudorp's team uh, in the context of diabetes. Essentially, they were comparing allogenic fecal transfer, um, transfer of microbiota from lean, non-diabetic volunteers with, as a control, autologous fecal transfer, where the diabetic patient was its own donor of feces. And the main outcome criteria was insulin sensitivity. Now, the trial showed that uh, upon allogenic transfer from a non-diabetic patient, uh, there was a marked improvement in uh, insulin sensitivity, whereas in the control, uh, autologous transfer, there was no impact. And the Last example I want to give is work that was just published in Nature Communication um, uh, and reporting on a proof of concept study of autologous microbiota transfer in the context of acute myeloid leukemia. Upon um, diagnosis, patients were uh, subject to sample collection, fecal sample collection, and stool were conditioned to be re-administered uh, after the first induction chemotherapy followed by antibiotics. Now we look at alteration of the microbiota. We see major alteration of the microbiota between the uh, diagnosis and the end of chemotherapy plus antibiotics. And upon re-administration of the microbiota, autologous uh, microbiotherapy, we see reconstruction, roughly 90% of microbiota recovery based on several indices. Uh, when we look specifically at butyrate producing, which I call here beneficial bacteria, essentially they lose the dominant uh, composition of the microbiota upon chemotherapy, and they are fully restored upon microbiotherapy, microbiota transfer. And if we look at the neopterin as a biomarker of inflammation, well, we see a burst of inflammation and following uh, microbiota transfer, we see a restoration of immune homeostasis. Uh, in this context, there was excellent safety profile. And even if 84% survival with a small cohort of 25 patients, which is uh, slightly more than the 70% historical control. <clears throat> Um, I'm getting close to the end. Uh, just wanted to stress the fact that uh, alteration of man microbe symbiosis can be moderate. And in this case, it can be restored by functional food, by nutrition, including fibers. But if it goes beyond the uh, resistance and resilience, it, if it goes beyond the robustness of the system, then it may be necessary to uh, have a uh, uh, to use fecal microbiota transfer being autologous if the samples can be collected before or allogenic. Uh, as a conclusion, um, take home messages, altered host microbe symbiosis will lead to loss of protective functions of the microbiota. Circular causalities and alternative stable states may apply to host microbe symbiosis and monitoring symbiosis could be uh, an improvement, integrating microbiota and host parameters, but also prevention or cure, indeed targeting several triggers of a vicious circle uh, using um, nutrition with diverse bioactives could really have a, an impact, could make a difference. And finally, I want to stress again that uh, innovation is necessary in trial design. Novel methodologies are needed to tackle clinical conditions that involve 
alteration of host microbe symbiosis. Um, I will thank you for your, your attention with this slide. And just before I finish, I want to invite you to uh, check on the web, actually, the Arte <coughs> documentary on the microbiota that is now uh, freely accessible since, uh, since last week. Thank you for your, for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Joel, for, for this great talk, uh, as usual. Um, so maybe just one question before we move uh, to, uh, to the talk of, of Yolanda. And again, all the questions will be answers at, at the end of both talk. Uh, this concept of circular causality, it's really fascinating, but I think that for many people, it's very complicated to, to, to tackle. So how can you... Uh, maybe explain it uh, in simple words. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, it, I make it complicated and it's probably just a simple view of the real uh, biology, but still uh, the two key parameters are the microbiota and the immune system, hence the richness of the microbiota and inflammation. And in many of the chronic conditions I was mentioning, we have documented alteration of the microbiota together with inflammation. Very often it's only low-grade inflammation, such as in the context of metabolic conditions, obesity, type 2 diabetes, but still we have both that are altered. And well, what I try to stress is the fact that uh, today in preventive nutrition or in medicine, we only tackle one of the two uh, where we could actually be in a situation to try and address several elements of what can actually turn in circle at some point. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you, Ari. Um, so now I give the floor to Yolanda Sons for, for her talk. Well, good evening, everybody. And thanks so much, Bromatech and ESMN for the kind invitation to participate in this webinar. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you uh, what we are doing uh, to understand Yes, wait a moment. Oh. How we can, uh, with the diet, optimize the functions of our intestinal microbes and in this way contribute to human health. Well, the microbes that inhabit different parts of the human body and especially those inhabiting the, the gut, they play important physiological roles uh, in many functions, for example, contribute to the metabolism of nutrients and uh, their absorption, also educate and stimulate our immune uh, system, also contribute uh, to our endocrine functions and also to brain function and behavior. And in support of uh, these principles, uh, many studies have been published showing associations between uh, alterations in the gut microbiota composition and function, what is called dysbiosis that Joel has defined very well, and uh, many disorders, not only those affecting locally the gastrointestinal tract, like inflammatory bowel diseases or cancer, but also many others affecting different organs and functions from uh, diabetes, to obesity and mental disorders. However, despite the fact that uh, there are a large uh, body of evidence showing associations, it has been much more difficult to identify which are the members of the rat microbiota that are causally involved in health or disease. And this slide reflects, yes, a case, the case of obesity where many papers have been published showing many different associations of potential biomarkers of obesity, but uh, there was uh, no consensus on the signatures that were related to an obese or a lean phenotype. And recently in a meta-analysis, including uh, 10 uh, studies where the data were reanalyzed, it was concluded that these biomarkers were not consistently linked to obesity, but only uh, diversity that was low diversity was associated with an obese phenotype. And it was also questioned whether this microbiome uh, marker 
could have a biological meaning that could be explained uh, in a me mechanistic manner. And in fact, this is the case because uh, our gut microbiota act at the interface between the host and the environment. And there are many interacting factors that could explain microbiome variation. So it's difficult to infer which are the cause and the effects, and which are the moderators and the mediators of the uh, healthy states or disease states. So uh, among the endogenous factors, uh, body max index is one of the variables uh, clearly linked to our gut microbiota uh, that can explain part of the variation, but also sex and also uh, part of the genetic background of the host. And well, also the environment plays a major role in defining uh, microbiota variations. We know about the role of the diet, but also medication plays an important role and probably also other factors like the stress uh, imposed by the environment where we live. Especially uh, the diet is one of the major drivers of the gut microbiota composition and function. And this has also downstream effects on the way it impacts on different organs and systems. But also uh, the microbiota of the host influence our response to the diet and the way uh, the food we eat is processed and digest and the metabolites that are later generated in such a way that this evidence has changed the way we define what is a healthy or an unhealthy diet or a healthy or unhealthy food. Because in fact, we start believing that this does not depend only on the composition in micronutrients or micronutrients as was traditionally considered in nutrition, but this could also be influenced by the gut microbiota of the individual because this can change the energy value of the same diet, the nutritional uh, quality, and also in the end, the dietary health effects. Well, uh, we have uh, relatively um, large knowledge about uh, how fibers are metabolized and which are the major metabolites that are produced from the action of uh, the intestinal microbes. For example, salt so chain fatty acids are the metabolites uh, whose physiological functions are the best characterized. For example, butyrate and propionate uh, can play a role regulating immunity. BIP genetic mechanisms, it has been shown that butyrate uh, regulates the production of T regulatory cells. Also, butyrate and propionate can induce uh, the production of uh, endocrine peptides like glucagon like peptide 1 and peptide uh, YY that uh, influence appetite via endocrine or paracrine routes and can also influence a uh, well glucose metabolism. But recently we have started also discovering uh, the role of new metabolites like for example, succinate that can also uh, be used uh, by the uh, epithelial cells uh, for uh, gluconeogenesis, uh, contributing to an improvement in glucose metabolism in the liver, for example. And we also have started accumulating evidence that not all fibers exert the same effect and that this effect will also depend on the individual microbes of the host. We have also information on the role the microbiota plays in the metabolism of proteins and especially amino acids. But so far, uh, the studies have been focused on the adverse role of these uh, catabolic uh, reactions carried out by the microbes we have in the large intestine, contributing to the generation of toxic compounds uh, that could have adverse effects on the kidney or the uh, intestinal mucus. But uh, we are in time uh, also discovering uh, new metabolites that could also play uh, some beneficial roles, for example, tryptophan that is essential for immune function and other uh, amino acid uh, metabolites that are in fact neurotransmitter and could impact 
the nervous system uh, in the uh, enteric branch uh, and also reach uh, the central nervous system. So on the basis of these interactions between the gut microbiota and the diet, uh, some years ago in 2013, we initiated a large European project called My New Gut, where we start delineating which could be the role in future dietary recommendations and how the diet could uh, promote the functions of the gut microbiota that could also work in favor of our health, analyzing the effects of the diet, the different micronutrients, fiber, proteins, and fats on the gut microbiota and its correlation with different health endpoints, and especially we focus on obesity and mood disorders. And well, uh, in this effort, uh, we also identify the need to progress towards development of causality and uh, also utilizing this uh, evidence to transform the way we tackle uh, different disorders and promote health in our population. But to do so, we also uh, identify important needs uh, in the experimental setups and the investigation we were doing in this field. First of all, uh, we stress the need of performing uh, not only cross-sectional studies, but also longitudinal studies in such a way we could control and monitor the microbiota uh, at several time points, also controlling for confounder factors or the variables that I mentioned before in the phenotype uh, human cohorts, where we could understand uh, those interacting factors and the causal role in different morbidities. We also stress the need of uh, showing experimentally uh, that these correlations and associations uh, could be causally related to health or disease outcomes and also the need of testing hypotheses in models and also through human intervention trials, and also the need of understanding the mode of action of key microbes or metabolites that could act as biological mediators of the health effects at cellular organ or system level. So in order to address these needs, we perform, for example, a long uh, longitudinal studies a study to investigate whether the gut microbiota could be a predictor or predisposing factor for the development of obesity in children. So we take advantage of a cohort already established in a previous European project, IDEFIX and iFamily, where uh, initial samples were collected uh, at the year 2009 and 10. And then we have the possibility with this MyNugat project to collect a second round of samples in 2013-14 uh, uh, after four years follow-up. In this way, we could identify children that remain normal weight and those that uh, develop excessive weight gain and develop overweight and obesity. And also controlling all these parameters, the diet, the physical activity, uh, the metabolic markers, inflammatory markers, we could start drawing some conclusions about the direction of causality. So from this study, we could categorize the children in four different clusters according to the coabundance of genera with the microbiota, showing that these two clusters C1 and C2 were those uh, where the infants uh, have microbiotas with a higher diversity and include most of the infants that remain normal weight. While in these clusters, especially in the C4, we observed that uh, we could include most of the uh, children that develop overweight and also the microbiota show lower diversity and increases in inflammatory markers. As well as expected also these microbiota clusters segregate with dietary patterns. In fact, these C3, C4 microbiota clusters showing lower, the lowest diversity, those uh, were related uh, to the uh, dietary patterns that were considered less healthy, like those characterized by a higher intake of carbohydrates or fats or higher intakes of protein and fat. 
So uh, in principle, there were clear associations between the dietary habits and the microbiota profiles even before of the development of overweight and obesity. And well, we could also identify some associations between different food items and this low diversity like sweetened drinks or fast food in general that were related to cluster C4, C3. And also we could relate uh, the food intake of fish, but also yogurt or fermented milk, nuts or whole uh, meal bread. This means uh, plant-based foods and fermented foods with this uh, increased microbiota diversity and the higher abundance of, for example, prevotella and reduced uh, presence of inflammatory markers. So uh, in few words, uh, it was uh, concluded that the diet microbiota configuration could predispose or protect from the development of obesity in this four year time interval. And in fact, in later studies that have been recently published, uh, even if these are uh, cross-sectional studies, uh, the large size of the studies uh, have shown also uh, and have been able to replicate some of these correlations. This is a study carried out in general population, but also concluding that healthy dietary choices and the intake of plant and fiber rich uh, foods were associated with a more diverse microbiota and a greater, uh, greater potential uh, of these microbes to produce or chain fatty acids. And while this is a completely different study that was carried out in um, a cohort of patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, but including also healthy controls, where they also conclude that the intake of plant-based foods were linked to searching fatty acid production and also um, a healthier microbial ecosystem and reduction of pathogens uh, inducing pro-inflammatory uh, responses. But while well, going back to my previous slide, uh, in our project, we also consider very important uh, to progress towards approving causality and testing hypotheses also through human intervention trials. And uh, to do so, and also to contribute to inform future dietary recommendations, for example, we perform an intervention with uh, proteins, uh, increasing not only the amount of protein from the diet, but also the source of protein from the diet, to investigate whether the microbiota could be involved in some of the health-related outcomes that could be identified after the intervention. We choose uh, high-protein diets because protein intake in Western countries is higher than recommended. High-protein diets are usually recommended to um, reduce body weight, in general, we can conclude that uh, these high protein diets increase satiety, facilitate body weight reduction in short times, and uh, exert some beneficial effects on lipid metabolism, for example, but could also uh, cause adverse effects on kidneys and cause intestinal inflammation, as is reported in literature. But we wanted to understand uh, also. Uh, to what extent the gut microbiota could be involved uh, in these effects, and also especially whether the source of protein could play a role. Well, uh, proteins are mainly digested in the upper part of the intestine, where they can, uh, in the context of high protein diets, can exert uh, metabolic, beneficial metabolic effects. But in the context of these dietary regimens, also a larger part of the uh, protein we have intake uh, is also reaching the large intestine where uh, the metabolic activity of the microbiota is more intense. So we wanted uh, to compare the effects of a source, um, of an animal source of protein, casein, and a plant source of protein, soy, because uh, these were uh, good examples to be compared in the sense that uh, they differ in amino acid composition and they also differ clearly in digestibility, showing uh, the lowest one in the case of soy protein. 
So we start a parallel intervention trial uh, where in one arm of uh, the subjects receive placebo, maltodextrin, in the other arm, the subjects receive a casein as a protein, and in the other arm, uh, the subjects receive soy as a source of protein. And in this case, in this case, there was a normal protein intake, and in these two cases, there was a high protein intake. And while we could only observe uh, improvements in systolic blood pressure in those subjects that um, have soy as a source of protein in the diet because the diets were isocaloric, so we could not identify any other uh, changes in metabolic parameters. But what was more relevant from this study is that we observed for the first time that in relation to the metabolites that appear in urine, after these dietary uh, interventions, we could uh, find difference in the production of paracresol and paracresyl sulfate, which are toxic uh, metabolites uh, for the kidney. And this was the case uh, in the cast protein diet, but not in the soy uh, protein diet. So from this study, we conclude that not only the amount of protein of the diet matters, but also the source of protein. And this is a, a variable that should be investigated further and also probably considered in uh, future dietary recommendations directly related to the role the microbiota plays in uh, the metabolism of proteins. Well, in this direction, we also uh, try to prove causality in another case. This is a study that Joel has also mentioned, proving that the uh, transference of the microbiota of lean individuals to subjects that uh, suffer from metabolic syndrome, uh, it was possible to uh, improve uh, insulin sensitivity. And this was associated with increases in a butylate producers in bacteria that were able to produce the short chain fatty acid. But uh, at this stage, it was unclear whether uh, there was a relationship, a causal relationship between the production of butylate and these uh, improvements in insulin sensitivity. So we wanted to progress further and we perform another intervention trial in uh, metabolic syndrome patients. By, but in this case, uh, one of the arms of the intervention uh, was submitted uh, to a fecal transfer. Uh, the fecal uh, donors uh, were healthy donors. Uh, we perform what is called analog to uh, fecal microbiota transfer. And in this case, uh, the subjects with metabolic syndrome receive uh, an autologous fecal microbiota transplantation and uh, also receive capsules with butyrate to be sure whether butyrate could be uh, a mediator of effects or the effects uh, were due to changes in the gut microbiota uh, due to or caused by the fecal microbiota transplant. So in this experiment, we could not replicate the effects on insulin and glucose metabolism seen in the previous study, probably because the sample size was uh, relatively small. But we could observe uh, new findings. We could observe that as a consequence of the fecal microbiota transplantation and the changes in the my ecosystem, there was an increase in the expression of dopamine receptors in the striatum in the brain uh, and a better control of food intake. So in this case, for the first time, we demonstrate the existence of the gut-brain access in the context of obesity and how this communication mediated also by changes in the microbiota and metabolites could improve the control uh, of food intake via the dopaminergic system. And while we also established correlation with increases via fecal transplants of prebotella and bacteroides uniformis, and in fact, recently we have shown that bacteroides uniformis could play a causal role in the uh, control of food intake. And well, in uh, this line of experiments, intervention trials in humans, uh, other uh, authors have also investigated to what extent 
the individual's uh, microbiota could influence our response to the diet. In this study published in 2015, it was shown how the integration of microbiome data together with other variables in mathematical algorithms could help to predict the response, the glycemic response to different uh, diets and different food components, demonstrating that the uh, predictive value of this algorithm was much higher than uh, the traditional way of predicting this glycemic response based on the calories of the food or based on the carbohydrate content of the food. It was shown, for example, that uh, the glycemic peak of some individuals was quite high when they uh, intake banana, for example, but not when they intake cookies and there were individuals showing the opposite response, pointing into the direction that uh, perhaps we could apply these approaches to personalize the nutritional advice in the future. And well, more recently, uh, the group of uh, team uh, Spector and Nicole Sigata also have worked uh, in another large cohort of twins, where they can differentiate genetic effects from other environmental uh, factors, effects. And they conclude that the microbial composition uh, helps to predict uh, cardiometabolic blood markers, including uh, fasting and postprandial glycemic and lipemic response, and also some inflammatory index. But they conclude that the best associations and the best predictions were related to uh, the circulating lipids and the uh, response uh, in terms of uh, triglycerides to different foods. And well, they also highlight that uh, the strongest microbiome diet associations were driven by poorly characterized microbes, so indicating that a lot of efforts uh, still have to be done uh, in, in this uh, context in order to better characterize uh, which are the microbes inhabiting our gut and contributing to these uh, dietary health effects. And while they also uh, conclude, as in previous uh, large-scale studies, that microbial species could be associated with uh, more or less healthy plant or animal-based foods and healthy dietary habits. And in this context, and uh, taking into account this information, they are trying also to optimize dietary advice depending on the individual. And well, this is a last example of how this information is being used in practice. Uh, the group of Jeffrey Gordons at the US uh, are already trying uh, to develop uh, foods uh, that are targeting the microbiota of undernourished children, uh, trying to provide additional uh, health effects to restore and repair uh, these alterations in the microbiota and promote uh, in a more efficient way than the traditional therapies, uh, the development, the, the correct development of the children, uh, the adequate development of uh, bone markers and also immune and uh, neurodevelopmental markers. They have already published a proof of concept trial transferring the microbiota uh, from undernourished children to notobiotic uh, pigs, uh, demonstrating that this is uh, feasible. And they have also already published uh, um, a proof of concept uh, study uh, to demonstrate uh, if this is also an efficacious uh, way of tackling uh, malnutrition in children. And well, uh, in the context of our project, uh, we have also uh, tried to progress from these correlations we are establishing in longitudinal studies uh, and confirm uh, those correlations using uh, experimental models and trying to understand further the mode of action of the bioactive microbes or metabolites. And while well, example, 
but uh, this strategy is uh, being applied to many other disorders where we are trying to identify uh, whether uh, specific microbes uh, could be effective tackling obesity and the comorbidities, and whether this could be a new generation of probiotics or live biotherapeutic products uh, used in clinical practice. Trying also to understand whether these bugs act on the immune system at the level of the nervous system or the entire endocrine system. So in, the, in this context, different uh, research groups are trying uh, to verify uh, the effectiveness of some of the bacteria that have been associated with lean phenotypes in observational studies like Ackermansia municifera, Oreobacterium halley. In particular, we have worked with a species of bacteroides because in our studies, uh, was associated with a lean phenotype. Also, bacteroides uniformis was associated with breastfeeding in infant studies that protects against obesity and type 2 diabetes. And in fact, doing an intervention trial in uh, diet-induced obesity uh, models, we conclude that this could improve the metabolic phenotype, mainly acting at the level of the immune system. And to make the story short, we conclude that the obesogenic diet rich in fat and fructose causes dysbiosis, reducing the presence of bacteroides. This uh, reduced expression and signaling of toller receptor 5. This uh, was associated with increases in uh, immune uh, cells promoting inflammation like M1 microphages and T cytotoxic cells in the Bayer patches of the intestine, and also reductions in uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this inflammatory profile was also reproduced partially in peripheral blood and metabolic organs like the adipose tissue, leading to glucose intolerance and an obese phenotype. In contrast, uh, when we feed the mice with bacteroides, we restore partially the dysbiosis, increasing the presence of bacteroides. We also increase uh, the expression of toller receptor 5, probably through direct effects of the bacteria, but also probably through indirect effects through the modifications uh, introduced by the bacteria in the ecosystem, which could lead to the production of butyrate, which has been shown to increase expression of toller receptor 5, that in turn has been related to the induction of T-regulatory cells and uh, the production of IL-10 in the gut which could also be translated into other organs and tissues contributed uh, to uh, restore uh, glucose tolerance and a lean phenotype. But well, we wanted also to investigate uh, if we could improve the effectiveness of a specific intestinal bacteria, feeding these bacteria with a specific fibers, we have the information of the genome of this strain bacteria, this uniform is 7771, and we know that there are many genes involved in the utilization of oligosaccharides. So we test the ability of different uh, carbon sources to uh, improve the growth of these bacteria in vitro, showing that this width strand enriching an amino silence, silence uh, increased the speed of growth of these bacteria, reducing the doubled, uh, doubling time. So we um, perform experimental setup very similar to the previous one, but including other two experimental groups, one receiving the fiber and placebo, and the last one receiving fiber and bacteroides uniformis in such a way we could differentiate between the effects of the fiber, the effects of the bacteria, and the combined effects of both ingredients. And in this case, we used the bacteria at a lower concentration as in the previous study. So we could conclude, for example, that the wheat bran extract uh, increase the effectiveness of the bacteria reducing body weight and fat mass because the uh, strongest effects were achieved when we combine both ingredients. Although only an effect of food intake could be identified as a consequence of the fiber intake. This was well correlated with the fact that the fiber also caused an increase in the expression of proglucagon which um, 
could indicate an increased production of incretins like glucagon lipeptide 1 that could signal via endocrine or paracrine mechanisms uh, inducing satiety. And in relation to the improvements in glucose metabolism, we could observe that the main actor was uh, the bacteroides uniformis, although uh, the wheat bran strat could also, to some extent, promote the effects, improving also the glycemic levels at fasting state. But in relation to the role of the intervention in improving uh, the oral glucose metabolism, we could observe that both the bacteria alone and the combination of the wheat bran extract and the bacteria were those that improved more significantly uh, the oral glucose tolerance. And well, we also tried to understand whether these uh, ingredients could improve the gut barrier and the immune function. In this case, we focus on uh, innate lymphoid cells, uh, a component of the innate immune function that is well less uh, understood, but that uh, is also well connected with metabolism and also some components of adaptive immunity. And we observe uh, first, that the combination of the fiber and bacteroides uniformis could increase uh, the expression of occludin, showing an effect on the gut barrier function, which is important to avoid systemic inflammation in the context of hypercaloric diets, as was this model. But uh, we also observed that this combination of ingredients also exert important effects in intraepithelial, um, sorry, in innate lymphoid cells. We observed that obese mice show increases in uh, innate lymphoid cell ones that are pro-inflammatory and contributors to increases in interferon gamma, while the combination of the two ingredients reduce significantly the proportions of ILC ones as well as interferon gamma. And in parallel, this was related to an increase in the proportions of ILC threes that tie innate lymphoid cells that are involved in the reparation of the gut barrier and inhibit, in fact, ILC ones, and also increase the intestinal barrier to the production of IL-22 and antimicrobial peptides, which could also help to restore um, dysbiosis associated with the obesogenic diet. So again, we show how uh, the combination of active ingredients could also activate new mechanisms of action protecting against diet-induced obesity. But while we have also investigated the role of other bacteria in obesity to show you how different bacteria could play many different roles. And in this case, we use a, a species of Oldemanella that was associated also in our observational studies in humans with a higher intake of fibers and linear phenotypes, observing that it exerts a protective effect in relation to glucose metabolism, showing improvements in oral glucose tolerance and also in the fasting levels of glucose. And we also observed improvements in glucose and insulin signaling in the liver. But these bacteria did not show significant effects on any of the immune parameters that we evaluate. So if we investigate whether endocrine effects could be mediating these improvements in glucose metabolism. And in fact, we could observe increases in the plasma levels. So glucagon lipeptide 1, as I had told you, uh, participate in the control of glucose metabolism. We could also observe improvements in the expression of the receptor in different parts of the intestine, and also increases in the expression of peripherin, that is a neural marker that uh, is associated with the activation of the enteric nervous system. So it could be the case that via uh, endocrine mechanisms or via signaling through the enteric nervous system, uh, this bacteria could also improve glucose metabolism. But also to test uh, whether um, there was neural activation, we also um, performed some in vitro experiments in uh, neuron cultures. We could observe that the bacteria itself could activate um, the calcium exchange that uh, was an indicator of activation of the neurons. 
but we also use uh, some more uh, as a closer uh, model to the neurons that could mediate also vagal signals to the brain, um, neurons extracted for the nodos ganglius. And we could observe that the bacteria could depolarize the membrane, also glucagon lipeptide ones, uh, something that was uh, previously known, but we could also prove that the bacteria could increase uh, the sensibilization of these neurons to glucagon lipeptide one, and perhaps increase the effectiveness of these hormones, not only via endocrine routes, uh, but also via paracrine mechanisms and signaling through the vagal afferents. We also observe change in the gut ecosystem that could secondarily contribute to these effects, increases, for example, in blautia and akkermansia that are known to be producers of sore chain fatty acids. Uh, we also uh, observe improvements in some gut barrier markers that could contribute to improvements in glucose metabolism. And also doing a lipidomic analysis, we could uh, identify improvements in the concentrations of MUFAS that have been identified as secretagogues of glucagon like peptide 1. So in summary, uh, from uh, all the aspects I touched upon my talk, we can uh, keep the following messages. While well, dietary recommendations uh, from authoritative bodies uh, has currently stands, such as increases in fiber, uh, decreases in protein and saturated fat intake, or uh, diversifying the diet are uh, quite in line with the evidence and associations we have established between dietary habits and uh, what we consider so far what is a healthy microbiota, and that is mainly associated with uh, higher diversity and uh, with uh, those bacteria producing, for example, sort of chain fatty acids. The question is whether uh, advancing in, under, in our understanding of the role the microbiota play in these interactions, we are going to be able to inform future dietary recommendations and refine these general dietary recommendations in favor of uh, our health. Uh, regarding more specific uh, advice uh, regarding the different uh, nutrient categories. I show you an example with proteins and perhaps we could progress in the future uh, to give more uh, precise recommendations, for example, regarding the, the role of different sources of proteins as well. Also, it's been demonstrated through large-scale studies that the uh, Soviet's microbiome may help to predict disease risk and also probably the response to different diets and dietary components. And this can be instrumental to progress towards personal health nutrition. But the question is whether this could be affordable and applicable at population scale to improve our general health status and prevent disease that is a major uh, goal uh, we may try to achieve uh, through the diet. And also, uh, we, we are showing uh, important examples of how we can progress towards the identification of effector intestinal bacteria and a specific dietary patterns and components that could help to optimize the function of these bacteria in such a way we can develop real transformative microbiome-based solutions uh, in favor, for example, of our metabolic health, but there are many other examples. And uh, we are also showing how progressing in this field, we can also dissect how uh, different intestinal bacteria will play many different functions and act through different mechanisms of action, ranging from immunity to neuro and endocrine routes. And while we consider also that this mechanistic information is key to tackle not uh, disease uh, has uh, whole entities like obesity, but also the different subtypes within, for example, obesity. But uh, while uh, we uh, should uh, question ourselves what we should do further to solve technical uh, challenges and also regulatory challenges in these fields, for example, 
how we can progress in the cultivation of bacteria that we have not characterized so far and perhaps are within these bacteria that are relevant for these diet micro interactions uh, and relationships uh, with our health, how to replicate complex microbiota to overcome the safety concerns of fecal microbiota transplantations and how, for example, to establish safety standards for the approval of all these uh, microbiome-based products. And well, finally, I want to thank all my collaborators uh, that uh, there is no time to mention, and also all of you for your great attention and also the organizers again for the kind invitation to this interesting webinar. And also, I will be happy to participate in the discussion and the questions you may have. Thank you very much, Yolanda, for this uh, great talk. Um, so I want to remind everyone that you can ask your question in the chat and we will try to answer uh, most of them uh, very soon. So please do not hesitate. Uh, I just want to ask you one question, Yolanda, before we, we move to a short video. Um, obviously, diet is a very powerful way to modulate the microbiome. Uh, but we, we already know that diet is a very powerful way to improve our health. And despite that, it, it's still very difficult to apply it in real life. So what is your opinion about that? Well, I think that we are making uh, very important progresses in this entangling, uh, which is the, play, the, the major player in, in its context. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, uh, this, the study system is uh, so complex that it will still take some more uh, time and efforts uh, to guide people uh, towards uh, the way uh, they should uh, feed themselves to protect the microbes and to protect their health. But I think that uh, we are making uh, many efforts in this direction and we will uh, see the the fruits of uh, this advance uh, relatively soon. And uh, we also have to consider uh, that it's also equally important not only to identify this diet micro interaction uh, effects on different aspects of our health, but also which are the major the microbial players, because in this way we will be able to uh, define more precisely with uh, dietary strategies can be used to feed specifically this bacteria and not single bacteria. This bacteria within a context ecosystem because probably uh, the functions do not depend only on one unique bacteria, but also on the dialogue between this bacteria and the rest of the ecosystem. So I think we are on the right uh, way, on the right track uh, to get major advance uh, in an applied way um, but uh, we don't have all the clues in our hands yet. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, so we'll have more questions soon. Uh, I want now to invite, invite you to, to see a short promotional video from our sponsor, Bromatec. And I want to, to thank again Bromatec for uh, their support tonight. We have just a few minutes video and then we come back. Bromatech welcomes all participants to this international event entitled Microbiota and Gut-Brain Connection, a new frontier in neurogastroenterology organized in partnership with the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. It is a pleasure and honor for Bromatech to sponsor this important and unique scientific forum. Bromatech is a biotech company that conducts research into the properties of bacteria since 1985. At the forefront of development for probiotics for human use, Bromatech is now an established company with a clear product offering for the natural treatment of the digestive system. The bacteria in the microbiome help digest our food, regulate our immune system, influence our behavior and protect against other bacteria that cause disease. The strain specificity and efficacy of its probiotic products differentiate Bromatech from other companies. Mastering the natural attributes of nature for a harmonious life is Bromatech's inner motivation. 
Nature can teach us much more than we presently know. Microbes inhabit just about every part of the human body. We humans are mostly microbes. Over 100 trillion of them live in our body. Microbes outnumber our human cells by 10 to 1. The majority live in our gut, particularly in the large intestine. Over the years, Bromatech has built a research team that constantly analyzes the use and properties of bacteria that form part of the microbiome. Advances in genome sequencing technologies and metagenomic analysis, that is, the genetic study of genomes taken directly from environmental samples, have enabled scientists to study these microbes and their function, and to research microbiome-host interactions both in health and disease. Partnerships with universities and other research centers provide a valuable source of inputs as knowledge transfer between academia and industry is an important driver of innovation. By means of laboratory testing and relentless gathering of clinical data, the company continually develops its own formulations. Scientific works and medical literature support our products. The human microbiome has extensive functions such as development of immunity, defense against pathogens, host nutrition including production of short-chain fatty acids important in host energy metabolism, synthesis of vitamins and fat storage as well as an influence on human behavior, making it an essential organ of the body without which we would not function correctly. Bromatech has a long experience in microbiota research that allows it to understand the interrelation of different bacterial strains and dose the right quantity for optimal results. This is done through a well-developed methodology that combines laboratory research, clinical trials and modern production solutions. Bromatech is committed to education. Over the years, it has regularly offered to the healthcare professional community multiple educational programs on the properties of bacteria and their interrelation with human health. To promote advancements in the understanding of the microbiome, it has founded congresses, seminars, academic courses and scholarships. The microbiome is dynamic and changes with early development, environmental factors such as diet and the use of antibiotics and in response to disease. The complexity and plasticity of the microbiota is important in maintaining homeostasis with the host's immune system and has an important impact on the digestive system. Speakers from different fields have had the opportunity to address participants sharing their clinical experience on the use of probiotics or presenting scientific research. An open debate is always welcomed at the end of each presentation and participants stimulate discussions with their questions. Bromatech educational programs introduce medical professionals to the comprehension of this fascinating area of biology. Thank you for your attention and participation. So thank you, thank you everyone. So we, we got many questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, and please do not hesitate if you have more questions. Uh, so we have questions for both uh, Joel and Yolanda. Um, so I, I will start, but uh, I think that if each of you has also question for the other, please do not hesitate to, 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 to ask. Uh, so one very important question I think uh, someone is asking, is there, is, is there are some laboratories in Europe performing shotgun metagenomics for clinical diagnosis? So maybe, Joel, I think you can answer this question. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was indicating in my slides that uh, we could uh, anticipate the next frontier where the clinician could prescribe microbiome profiling and use microbiome profiling or symbiosis status assessment in its practice. This is not available today. What we have seen over the past uh, five to 10 years is a spread of companies that offer uh, the characterization of the microbiota on a direct to consumer basis. So anyone who is uh, curious to know what uh, it looks like inside uh, can actually pay for the analysis and uh, will get a report that is essentially of little use for the clinician, as I mentioned, that the standards are not validated for 
the most usual assessment, which is based on 16S ribosomal DNA sequencing. Yet, I think that the, uh, the tools are here uh, for the future, uh, and uh, we are probably not very far from a situation where the practitioner will be able to prescribe and to actually obtain from a uh, medical biology laboratory a result of analysis probably initially fairly simple. We heard a lot about the richness of the microbiota, gene count, so that could actually come into, uh, into the early uh, assessments <clears throat> and become uh, a useful tool for the uh, decision-making process for the clinician. So not yet available, but probably soon coming. Thank you, thank you very much, Roy. Um, so maybe a question for Yolanda. Uh, Someone is asking uh, if you can summarize which foods, which type of, of nutrients are the most beneficial uh, for our microbiome. Well, if we would like to, to have this information and to have the, the strongest uh, scientific basis as possible to respond to this question, but what we know so far from studies that have been published is that uh, foods rich in fiber, in uh, polyphenols and so on, uh, seem to contribute uh, to a more diverse microbiota to certain chain fatty acid producers uh, that in principle contribute uh, to the health of our gut and probably many organs in the, in the body. But the knowledge we have so far, uh, it's very, very general. So we are talking uh, in the same terms, uh, almost uh, as uh, nutritionists uh, 50 years ago, in fact. But it's true that we are uh, performing very large scale studies now. We have started identifying food items uh, and food ingredients more specifically with more specific microbes in, in our gut. And progressively, I think we will be able to, to provide uh, better adv advice, not better, but more based on scientific evidence on this relationship between the diet and the microbes. Thank you, Yolanda. Joel, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I, I meant to say that um, there is um, in the question uh, a, a need to uh, document how uh, we can have direct impact on the microbiota. And indeed, uh, fibers is a, is a great tool, but you also have to think of possible indirect impact. So when we uh, mention uh, immunity, alteration of immunity as a, 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 an indicator of a, a problem of dysbiosis potentially, when we mention uh, oxidative stress, then you can imagine, immediately imagine that uh, some of the food constituents will be acting uh, on those parameters, will be uh, lowering inflammation, will be improving the quality and the integrity of the gut barrier, such as I mentioned glutamine, such as uh, omega-3 fatty acids, for example. And so it's it's complex feature where you can think of food acting on the microbiome for sure. Fibers is there, uh, polyphenols as well, probably. But also, they will be acting on a host parameters that are protective for the uh, integrity of the uh, of the gut context, basically. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, there is one question about autism spectrum disorders, because um, uh, in your uh, presentation, Joel, you, you mentioned specifically autism spectrum disorders. And I, I think maybe for the audience, it can, can be felt as maybe uh, very, I mean, very far from the gut. And, yeah. and, uh, so can you elaborate a little bit on what are the available data on this topic? Yeah, so I will just, if you remember, I was mentioning that when we think of a possibly documented causality, we can apply fecal transfer from man to animals. Usually we start with a patient or a healthy individual microbiota, and then we transfer that to animals and we see whether we reproduce the symptoms and we see a difference between healthy and disease. This has been done for autism, uh, work by uh, especially the, the team of Sarkis Mesmanian in, uh, in California. And they show actually that if you transfer the microbiota from autistic uh, infants into germ-free animals, 
which you let reproduce and you analyze only the second generation, then they have altered behavior, they have altered microbiota, they have altered metabolite composition, and they even have altered gene expression in the brain, especially for genes that already were identified as uh, predictors of potential uh, neurological uh, conditions. Um, so this is the first set. And I think it's a, it's a brilliant piece of work. And the second uh, element we have is the transfer we mentioned from humans to humans. And actually, Jim Adams uh, in the US uh, did a, a study so far, I would say a pilot study, only 19 uh, infants with autism and associated uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. And he used a very intensive uh, fecal microbiota transfer treatment for two months. And following that, uh, assess the improvement in gastrointestinal symptoms, but also in autism. And uh, he was starting with a cohort of uh, 19 infants, 80% with severe autistic uh, condition. And after the first four months, there was a significant amelioration or improvement of the GI symptoms. And there was also some improvement of uh, um, functionality, neural functionality and uh, exercise, ability to perform exercise for the, uh, for the autistic infants. That was re-observed or reanalyzed two years after. I think it's actually the parents who were suggesting to, uh, to revisit because they saw improvement in their infants. And indeed, Starting with 80% severe uh, autism, there were only 20% severe autistic uh, conditions after two years, and 40% of the infants had completely gone out of the autistic spectrum disorder. And so this is really striking. It needs further documentation, obviously. It needs further trials, more controlled trials also, which are yes. ongoing, as I understand. But this is quite striking. And it does confirm that the brain is talking with the, uh, the gut and the gut with the brain. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for this very good explanation. So one question for Yolanda. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a bacterial species that is appearing more and more frequently in the literature, uh, Prevotella copri. Um, and the question is, how should we see this species? Is it a good or a bad bacteria? Well, I can say that there are contradictory evidence in this regard. Uh, there is a large intervention that uh, was pointing into the direction that uh, this is the beneficial bacteria. In experimental models was shown that produce succinate and this could be used by enterocytes and uh, through this way could improve glucose metabolism in different organs, for example, in the liver. But uh, we also established in our own intervention studies uh, inverse associations between these species and uh, obesity and metabolic uh, disease outcomes. So we are still hesitating which could be the role and I think that more experimental trials should be conducted. We cannot disregard also the possibility that um, the bacteria behave differently depending on the experimental conditions and also that there could be a difference at the strain level not only at the species level, that could make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we are still looking at the microbes uh, in a very general manner because the complexity is so huge that we need to, to uh, simplify our study models and use reductionistic approaches. But we cannot disregard that uh, difference below the species level. This means that strain level also makes some difference. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, one other question uh, about intermittent fasting. Um, do you know, I don't know who wants to, to, an to, to, to answer this question. Do you know if there is any effect uh, of inter intermittent fasting on microbiota modification and particularly uh, any effect in, uh, in IBD context? Uh, well, I know that uh, there is an effect of fasting on gut microbiota and on the circadian rhythms that uh, also um, impact on the gut microbiota and on the host. 
that affect, for example, uh, corticosterone production in, in mice and cortisol in humans. So um, it makes a sense. It makes sense that uh, this could be a mechanism through which uh, the microbes and the food patterns uh, could uh, influence a whole body metabolism. Uh, but in another context, I, I don't have information. Perhaps Joel could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know of two publications actually in the field. So this is just the beginning, I would say. And it's not intermittent uh, fasting. It's a uh, complete fasting that was documented and that showed uh, uh, an impact, interesting impact on uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, markers, I would say. Uh, and so, um, yeah, fasting, if fasting does impact cortisol, as you were saying, it will also impact gut permeability. So there may be some interest in uh, in fasting, but... Intermittent fasting per se, I don't think that uh, we have the data. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so again, maybe a question for, for both of you. Uh, we talk tonight mostly about bacteria, although of course we, we mentioned other types of microorganisms. Uh, there is one question about uh, virus. Um, can you please, Tell us a little bit more about the virus present in, in our gut, uh, the type of virus, and maybe the, their impact in the in the ecosystem. I, I can give the answer of the uh, microbial ecologist <laughs> for that. Uh, the the main virus types that we uh, we have in the gut are bacterial viruses, which we call phages, and they are known as uh, really key regulators of uh, ecology. The basic principle you can think of is if a bacterium is um, overdeveloping, then its specific phage will develop and will control the population. So this is the very basic knowledge we have of uh, ecological regulation of microbial or bacterial populations by uh, bacteriophages. And this is highly active in the gut ecosystem as far as we can tell from counting phage particles, which are nearly a hundredfold higher in numbers than bacteria are. And it's, it's, a, it's probably an active regulator of the, uh, the gut ecosystem. Knowledge on phages is now improving quite a lot with the molecular assessments as we have uh, the tools to separate the uh, fraction of very small, very, very small uh, phage particles and then uh, do uh, genomics on those to uh, analyze their, their sequence. And the image we get from that, from the work of our colleagues in Ireland especially, is that there is a massive diversity. We still know very little of the massive diversity of phages that are present in the uh, intestine. Thank you very much. Um, there are more questions coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe one, yeah, one very interesting question uh, regarding liver. Uh, liver disease. Uh, what do you think about uh, the um, interaction between gut microbiota and liver disease, uh, notably the, the bidirectional uh, uh, relationship? Uh, yes. Well, who, who wants to, to, to answer this question? Well, uh, again, I can just say a few words of what has been documented in comparison of uh, patients and healthy individuals. In uh, liver disease, initially, we looked at uh, cirrhosis, global uh, condition of cirrhosis, meaning that uh, it can be uh, due to virus infection or it can be due to uh, alcohol consumption, for example. But still, when we look at cirrhosis versus healthy individuals, we find striking differences in the gut microbiota. And then recently, we looked at uh, various levels of severity uh, in the context of cirrhosis per se, but from uh, steatosis to uh, primary inflammation to uh, fibrosis uh, and then to uh, cirrhosis and uh, decompensated cirrhosis and acute and chronic liver failure. And in this context, what we have seen is the uh, striking link with the uh, richness or diversity of the microbiota, i.e. the more severe the condition, the lower the richness of the microbiota, so much so that it actually seemed in this work that we could uh, uh, anticipate or predict the, uh, the outcome, the fatal outcome of the condition or the extreme need for uh, transplantation of a liver lobe or of a complex liver. 
<coughs> well, we, we have work also on models of cirrhosis, uh, trying to intervene with uh, bacteria and specifically with bifidobacteria. And in models, at least the effects are uh, very important, restoring inflammation, especially. Okay. Thank because you. Because of the, the direct connection between the gut and the liver via the portal vein, there are a lot of uh, metabolites and uh, microbial uh, components that could travel from the gut to the, to the liver. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, uh, uh, and it goes in the other way with uh, the liver producing bile acids. Yeah, and then that's also exactly the same. It's, it's really a, a tight relationship with, with liver. Joel, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, there's been one, one trial of a fecal microbiota transfer in cirrhosis that I, I know of uh, in extreme conditions, actually, where um, uh, it was run in India. Uh, and they don't have the facilities probably to, uh, to do liver transplant as easily. And so in the extreme condition, patients are essentially uh, decompensating and there is a, a threat of death within a few months. And they were showing that uh, with microbiota transfer done once, they could actually maintain uh, the patients alive for one year, which was really uh, unexpected in terms of, uh, of impact. So... Yeah, it does show that uh, restructuring, at least part partially, uh, the symbiotic condition may actually have a very strong impact. Thank you. Um, one other question we, we have um, more and more, uh, at least as clinician working in the microbiome field, uh, what are the connections between the gut microbiota and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Um, yeah, I can, I can take this one. Um, so a ALS um, is a terrible condition where basically upon diagnosis, uh, the patients have uh, on average uh, three years of uh, life expectancy. And uh, there's been some work documenting uh, alteration of the microbiota. I, I will say dysbiosis to make it short. Uh, very little documentation on other uh, aspects of those we commented on, but it seems to be connected also with the uh, immune alteration. Um, and um, as is the case for many neurological conditions, the different pieces of work, uh, if you were able to meta-analyze, are not um, consensual. So there is no unidirectional observation for the moment. Uh, and so there is a need for a, a better assessment of what, uh, what is actually going on in terms of alteration of the microbiota in this condition. Um, the expectation would be that uh, a better uh, documentation of the alteration of the microbiota could actually um, uh, lead to uh, the design of uh, treatments microbiotherapy in general, treatments directed to the, uh, to the microbiota to help those patients. Um, if I uh, remove any hat I have and I, I answer personally, I think that uh, ethically speaking, uh, we should be uh, doing microbiotherapy in ALS today because the patients are condemned and so we should be doing uh, microbiotherapy. But this is a personal view. I, I agree with you, actually. I think we have to, to educate our neurologist colleague uh, to, to, to work with, with us. Uh, so if I, if I give my, my personal uh, um, experience with that, I've been solicited by many patients for that. I just mm. ask them to, to come to me with a, a neurologist, uh, yeah. at least to evaluate what we are doing. And, and so far, we... But it was difficult. So I think we, we still have to educate our colleagues uh, on, uh, on other fields that it might be interesting to try. Yeah. But um, Joel, in relation to the fecal microbiota transplants as therapy, are you so concerned about the safety issues that are being raised? Or well, I, I, you I'm don't concerned. Think that this is so. I'm concerned, but there has but been limitation. there has been hundreds of thousands of uh, fecal microbiota transfer today, and there's been a few cases of incidents. But in really the massive conditions, it's been applied every day now for Clostridium difficile. 
it's not it's a safe practice basically it's not a problem and if you are in a situation where the benefit risk is really completely overwhelmingly imbalanced such as in ALS then you have no reason to hesitate i would say <clears throat> Yes, just to, to, to complete, it's safe if it's medically uh, controlled. performed. Yeah, uh, controlled. Yeah. Meaning that you need to do the tests uh, for the donors and so on. We are doing in our centers FMT every day now for, for CDF mostly. Uh, and we didn't have any issues. Uh, and this is also the experience shared by, by all my colleagues. The only, there are a few problems. First problem is that you really have to test the donor the right, the, the right way. And I would really not uh, um, uh, suggest my patients to do FMT on their own uh, because they obviously cannot control the donor. And, and this is where uh, problems yeah. can, can be. You're right. One, one figure we can give is that uh, there are a few companies that uh, prepare material for, uh, for the transfer. And when they screen donors, you need to screen 1,000 to identify just less than 10 that will be acceptable on the basis of questionnaires and also obviously the control of the absence of any pathogen, viruses, bacteria, protists, whatever. And so this is well controlled by the regulatory agencies today. And uh, yeah, thanks to that, it's a safe practice when it's uh, under medical condition. Yeah, fully agree. Um... So I think we, we are at the end. So uh, it was a passionate discussion, so uh, time fly. So I want again to, to thank uh, you, Yolanda and Joel for uh, your talk, uh, your great talk. I want to thank uh, the organizer, uh, uh, the sponsor, uh, Bromatech, and also uh, ESNM for their support. And of course, I want to thank the audience uh, for uh, their question and their attendance. So thank you very much and, and good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.